Good morning. Welcome again. Kind of filled up since I welcomed everybody, so I feel like I need to say welcome again. Glad y'all are here. Matthew chapter 13 is where we are. If you have a Bible, turn there. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to finish up Matthew chapter 13 today. We've been looking at the the seven kingdom parables that are here, and that's what we call them, because Jesus uh, prefaces or begins each one of these parables by saying the kingdom of heaven is like. And so uh, we've looked at these parables, and today what we're going to do is look at uh, a couple of them here this morning, because these fit together. They're not actually in chronological order. I think chapter 13 is a little bit uh, more of a shotgun style. If he told all these parables at the same time, I'm not sure he did or not, but these fit really well together, so I've kind of grouped them up together and make basically three points um, that Jesus was making from these parables, and those are... Um, the, the, the kingdom of heaven seems like a small thing, but it can have a big impact. The kingdom of heaven's citizenship is exclusive, and the citizenship of the kingdom comes with a responsibility. I probably could have worked harder on that and got some alliteration in there, but take what you can get. All right, take what you can get. The, the first parable, look at verse 31. It's the parable of the mustard seed, and and the two that are grouped together there are the mustard seed and the leaven. So if you have a Bible, uh, turn with me there. Matthew chapter 13, we'll start in verse 31. Here's what it says. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when grown, it's taller than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. He told another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until it was all leavened. So first of all, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like a mustard seed, a very small seed, a little thing. It doesn't seem like much. It's kind of a small deal. Now, remember, he's speaking to the crowds most likely, but at least he's speaking to the disciples. He's going to ask them a question here in just a second. And so uh, if you can imagine how the disciples felt, hearing him preach about the the coming of the kingdom of heaven, having been selected as the the 12, his group, the the way he was going to spread the gospel throughout the whole world, um, this may be good news for them. Because they're probably looking around at each other, thinking, well, I'm glad he picked me, but he probably should have picked somebody with more influence than me. We got fishermen, tax collectors, nobodies. That's what they are. They're not great speakers. They're not uh, influential individuals. They aren't really highly thought of in society. They're a big group of nobodies, and that's who Jesus picks to reach the world. And Jesus tells these guys, look, um, it's a little thing. It seems like a little thing, but you can have really big impact. You can have a great impact. It's got to be good for them. He says it's like, a, it's like a seed, a mustard seed that's planted. By the way, mustard, uh, we usually think about it being in a yellow jar, but it's, it's a plant that they use for spices. Uh, it's, not, it's not just a condiment. So try to catch up. I really relish those opportunities. Um, you just plant this in a field, and it's primarily used for spices, or you could use the greens from the plant for mustard greens, a, a, a dish people would use. And it starts out very small, but can grow to a really big, a really big uh, plant that would grow out in the field. And that's true about the disciples. Think about their influence. Just a small band of people, but truly the influence of the disciples is still felt today. And friends, it's felt today in this room. Isn't that true? We're here today because of the faithfulness of these 12. So it starts out a little bitty thing, but it can really grow and get bigger. It becomes like a tree. It's a truth that we see throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. And it's this, God can do a lot with a little. God can do a lot with nothing, but he likes doing a lot with a little. Because when he does a lot with a little, then he gets the glory. So think all the way through the Bible, David and Goliath. Of course, little old David, little shepherd, run of the litter, takes out the big Philistine giant, Goliath. Gideon 
is afraid, and he's actually threshing wheat in a wine press. So he's hiding, threshing wheat, hiding from the armies that would be out there, the Midianites that would come and take all of his food away. He's hiding away when the angel of the Lord appears to him, and his army of 300 takes on a Midianite horde that would be so big you couldn't even number it. God likes doing that. God likes using little people, insignificant characters in the grand scheme of things, to do amazing, amazing things. He does it a lot. So he says it's like, a, it's like a little thing, like a seed. He says it's also like leaven. What we would probably say today is like yeast that would be mixed in with uh, dough to make the dough rise. But before we talk about that, n- notice that something interesting kind of happens here. I don't know if you notice or not. He says, first of all, that it's a, 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 like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in a field. And then in verse 33, he says, kingdom of heaven is like a leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour. Isn't it interesting that Jesus is trying to make these applicable illustrations to everybody in the crowd, speaking both to men and to women. If you're ever tempted to believe the Bible doesn't value women or Jesus didn't value women, these are these little moments where you say, oh, man, he, he was talking to the women and the men that were in the crowd, and in that day would be kind of unheard of. And so he uses what would at that time be a primarily masculine task, planting in the field, and also a primarily feminine task at that time, which would be baking bread or, or making bread. I know men who make bread today, but probably still it's primarily more of a, a, a task that ladies do. And um, speaking of women that are influential, uh, there's a, a woman named Lavina Bartlett you've probably never heard of. Lavina Bartlett was a, a woman's Bible study leader at a church in Great Britain, in England. And that church was called the Metropolitan Tabernacle of London. Now, you might have heard of that church because that was a church that Charles Spurgeon preached at, which is one of the most famous preachers of all times. And Charles Spurgeon preached, and it was a huge church. Thousands and thousands of people came, and probably a lot of them came because Charles Spurgeon was an awesome preacher it was back in the day when they didn't have microphones and PA systems, and in, in a room full of thousands of people, they said that you could hear him crystal clear. He had that kind of vocal range and ability. But this woman that served in his uh, church as a Bible study leader, Lavina Bartlett, uh, was the women's Bible study leader, and it's said that in her time as a women's Bible study leader, over a thousand women became members of Metropolitan Tabernacle because of her influence. It's a little old thing, right? A little women's Bible study. She's not the big celebrity guy on stage, but what a big impact. That's what God uses. He uses little things to make a big impact. Does it all the time. Now in the Bible, uh, leaven is usually bad, okay? Leaven is usually seen as, it uses an illustration for something negative in the Bible. Uh, For example, uh, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which he goes on to describe as hypocrisy. Uh, another time, you know, a couple times, Paul says to the church at Corinth and Galatia that, that leaven or sin can work its way throughout the whole body of the church. So a little bit of leaven works its way through the whole body. But, but here Jesus uses that as an illustration of something good. Isn't that interesting? He says the kingdom of heaven can uh, be like a seed, like a small thing that works its way through a big thing and has a big impact. So we see from the scriptures then that evil a little bit of sin, a little bit of wickedness can, can have a big effect on your life. But also, the gospel can have a big effect on your life. It kind of depends on which one you allow to have an effect on your life. But I think the point here is that a little goes a long way. A little goes a long way. It's pervasive, widespread in effect. 50 pounds of flour when, when leavened, when, when mixed with yeast, can make about 150 loaves of bread. That's quite a lot. It can also make between 100 and 130 pizzas, if you prefer. And I do. I actually, I did a little research and asked uh, Jeff down there at Godo Fredos how much flour it goes into a pizza. About 100 or 130 pa- uh, uh, pizzas in one 50-pound sack of flour when properly risen and leavened and, 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 and mixed with yeast. So it's pervasive. It's widespread. It goes throughout. It can have a big impact. Let me make an application this morning with those two parables in mind. Imagine 
if you just share the gospel with somebody. Maybe you just tell somebody about Jesus. You have a gospel conversation, okay? That's all it is. Maybe, maybe you plan it. You know what I mean? You call them up and say, hey, let's go out and eat lunch this week. Hey, let's go grab some coffee and catch up. I want to talk to you about something. And in your mind, you're ready to share the gospel with that person. Or you just find yourself in a situation and you feel the Holy Spirit prompting you. And instead of going, no, be quiet, be quiet, you just do it. You share the gospel. What a simple thing that is. You know, a little conversation. No big deal. We have hundreds of conversations all the time throughout our week. Don't think much of any of them. But, you know, that little gospel conversation can have a gigantic impact when you think about it. It could change the course of a person's entire life. Isn't that true? And not just their life. Their whole eternity could be changed by one conversation. Isn't that interesting? But not just their life. Think about the people under their influence. The people under their influence, their whole lives could be changed. Children could grow up in a Christian home when they might not normally because of one conversation you have with one person. You could have one gospel conversation with one person this week, and children who aren't even born yet could grow up in church because of your one conversation. They could grow up hearing the gospel in Sunday school and at vacation Bible school, and their little hearts could be changed with the gospel and be saved. It could change the whole course of their life because of one conversation you had with one person. It's widespread in effect. The gospel is powerful. The gospel is pervasive. It goes all throughout. Matter of fact, Paul, speaking to the Corinthians, he talked about this idea of kind of planting a seed of the gospel. He said it in these terms. He said, I planted the seed. Apollos, who was another uh, minister, watered it, but God gave the growth. And that's why. See, there's no power in your necessarily abilities to share the gospel or mine. The power is that when you're faithful and put the gospel seed out there, God brings the growth. And so you might plant the seed. You might water the seed. You might get to harvest the seed with that conversation. But God does all the work, and it's powerful the way it could change lives. I mean, somebody, somebody told you about the gospel. If you're a follower of Jesus today, somebody told you about it. Has it made an impact on you? Of course it has. It's freezing outside, and y'all drove all the way down here. But think of the way it's impacted your life, and probably in gigantic ways. So the message, the message is small. That's it. It's a simple thing. Isn't that true? The message is so small that a child can understand the message. Very simple. The message is small, but you know what? If you think about it, so was the messenger. He's born in a manger. He's born in a manger, but now he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf. When he was born, he didn't seem like much. Seemed like a little mustard seed or something along those lines, insignificant. But he's the most influential person that's ever lived on planet Earth. You know, and if you you go on and read the rest of this uh, chapter, starting in verse 53, it talks about his rejection at Nazareth. He goes to his hometown to preach, and they reject him. And the reason why they reject him is because they think it's too small. It's too small of a thing, this Jesus. Here's what it says, verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left there. He went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary? uh, Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Aren't they all with us? So, where does he get all these things? And they were offended by him. Isn't that interesting? They were offended by him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. See, they they just saw the, the smallness, the the insignificance, it seemed, of the messenger, and they couldn't listen to the message. They, they were so focused on the natural that they couldn't see the supernatural. It seemed like such a small thing to them. How could it be so big? They couldn't perceive it. 
See, the gospel is a small thing, but can have huge impact. Well, the next parable I want you to look at this morning is uh, in verse 47, and it's the parable of the net or the drag net, depending on your translation. And so in this parable, we learn that citizenship in the kingdom is exclusive. So the gospel is a small thing, but it can have a huge impact, and that also that citizenship in the kingdom is exclusive. Here's what it says, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. It collected every kind of fish, and when it was full, they dragged it ashore, sat down, and gathered the good fish into containers, but threw out the worthless ones. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out and separate the evil people from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So chapter 13 begins on a boat. Big crowd, so Jesus goes out on a boat, sits down. The people stand on the seashore, and that's who he's teaching to. So that could be the same context. I have reason to believe maybe this is a later time or something along those lines. But regardless, he speaks uh, this parable. He's at least probably close to the sea. He could still be on that boat. And in that case, imagine if he's on the boat, and he's probably gesturing to other fishing boats out there in the water fishing. And if you take a kid fishing... Oftentimes, it kind of seems inevitable, they'll ask this question. Why don't we just get a big net and catch all these fish? You know, you, you, you put a worm on a single line and throw it out and you hope to catch a fish. And kids are smart. They put these things together. Like, what if we just got a big net? We'll catch all these and be done. That's what ancient people did. And people still do that today when they fish for certain kinds of fish where that's legal. They drag a net behind a boat. Remember a few years ago, remember there's a big boycott on tuna, canned tuna. Why? Because they were killing all the dolphins, right? They were catching all the dolphins in the net, which is uh, unfortunate because everybody likes dolphins. But my question was, if we're catching them anyways, what do they taste like? I don't know. That's my question. I don't know. That's just for me. That was a big deal because that's how they caught. Now they have dolphin-safe tuna, dolphin-safe nets. The nets, the dolphins can get out, I guess. But that's the function of a net. It just collects everything. And people who drag a net to fish, they do. Imagine today if you did that. Probably catch spare tires and plastic bottles and all kinds of things out in the ocean. And this time they had all kinds of fish they would catch. And, and we catch sometimes today. We go out fishing Throw that line, we get a big bite, and we think, oh, man, we got a good one. And we reel it up, and it may be not something that we want to eat. A lot of times we call that a trash fish. Just throw that back. It's not worth cleaning. It's not worth eating or whatever. And that's what they do today. They drag a net. They first have to sift through the nets, right, throw everything back, maybe some things they're not allowed to catch, not allowed to keep, not, allowed, not good to eat, whatever the case may be. And this is a picture. It's a picture of a separation happening, a sifting a sifting of all of the sea of humanity, if you will. The net of God's judgment swept through the sea of humanity and collects everything, collects everything. And he says, so it'd be at the end of the age that the angels will go out and they'll do the separating. There will be a separating. There will be a, a, a sifting. See, citizenship in the kingdom of heaven is exclusive. It's for people who have heard the gospel message in their hearts they've believed in it put their faith in it, and been saved. It won't be this, uh, well, you know what, God in the end is going to let everybody into heaven or whatever. No, it's very, very distinct here in chapter 13. We've seen it a, a couple of times already. Remember the, the wheat will be gathered into the barn, and the weeds will be taken and burned in the fire. That's all they're good for. Here we have the worthless fish being thrown back out because they're good for nothing. They're not worth eating. And notice the sifting here. It says he'll sift the, the evil from the righteous. The evil from the righteous. Well, if you, if you know much about what the Bible teaches about humanity, that, that might jump out at you. Because the Bible says this. Doesn't the Bible say that none are righteous? No, not one. Well, who are these righteous people that he speaks of? And who are the evil people? Yeah, you know, usually we think about who are the evil people in our society and we can start thinking through, like, man, 
we've had big mass shootings this past week. Oh, those, that's probably that's some of those evil people, right? And you think about terrorists, and you think about historical figures like Hitler and Mao and all these terrible people out there. Yeah, those are the ones. But the truth is that the Bible communicates it. Uh, when we talk about all the evil people, we're talking about all of us. The Bible says none are righteous. No, not one. We all sin. We all fall short of God's glory. And we all fit into that category of the evil people. So then who will be collected into the barn? Who will be collected into the kingdom of heaven eternally? Well, only those who've been made righteous. See, nobody's righteous on their own, or nobody on their own can attain righteousness. We have to be made righteous. And for that to happen, somebody who is righteous, who is perfect, who's never sinned, would have to be willing to trade their righteousness for your sinfulness. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus, the perfect son of God, who never sinned, not even an evil thought, not an evil word, not one time, willingly left the comfort of heaven to come to earth, to take our punishment, to take our pain, to take our guilt, to trade for his perfect righteousness. So then, who are these righteous that will be gathered? Well, in the context here, citizens of the kingdom. He'll gather the citizens of the kingdom, and all those that aren't citizens of the kingdom will be cast out. How do we become citizens of the kingdom? Well, by faith. By faith. That's the prerequisite for kingdom citizenship. Faith in what Christ has already done on the cross. Accepting the free gift of salvation that he has offered us, God has offered us through his son, Jesus. And he says, the ones that aren't kept, the ones that aren't kept, have the same language used again, second time in this chapter, we're thrown into the blazing furnace. So in, in real specific terms then, kingdom citizens go to the kingdom of heaven for all of eternity. But those who aren't kingdom citizens, they go to hell which is called here a blazing furnace, where it says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Twice it says that. You know, I think sometimes there's this idea in popular Christianity that the, that the whole uh, idea or picture of hell is just kind of invented by uh, evangelical fundamentalists, you know, to scare people into submission. But, but the truth is, Jesus is the one who gave us the doctrine of hell most explicitly. Jesus talked about hell in the Bible more than anybody else. And so there's an invitation here to become part of, the citizen, part of the kingdom of heaven, become a kingdom citizen. But with that invitation comes a warning of what happens if you don't. Well, well didn't Jesus just teach us to love our neighbors and be good? And No. No, he talked a lot about a terrible, terrible place that most people will go when they die. Well, but isn't that kind of more of a figurative, isn't that more of a figurative, figure of speech? Well, he used really graphic language to describe whatever hell is going to be like. Really graphic. If it's just a, oh, it's really more metaphorical hell. Well, he used real literal language to describe a metaphorical hell, if that's the case. Very descriptive. He used it there about the weeds there in the parable of the wheat and the tares. He used it here about the fish. Jesus warned about hell a lot. Talked about it a lot. And, and here's why. Because um, I, I think he came to give everybody a way out of hell. And I believe if you're, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, Jesus is your way out of hell. Period. Period. And that's why he talked about it so much. Because he didn't want you to go there. He was trying to keep you out of there. That's why he talked about it all the time. So, so anybody who would say, well, you know, he can't forgive me, or, or I'm not part of the chosen, or I'm not, whatever. Listen, listen, if Jesus talked about hell like this, and the truth is you had no way out of hell, he'd be being mean. He'd be rubbing it in. The fact that he talked about it so much, I think, means you have a way out. 
if you'll embrace it today. Well, let's finish up the chapter here. Verse 51 is another little quick, 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 short parable. Here's what he says. Have you understand all these, understood all these things? They answered him, yes. Now, when you read that, <laughs> you're probably a little skeptical like me, right? Because like, remember, remember just a few verses earlier, they're like, why are, you, why are you talking to people in parables? Why are you speaking to them in parables? You've got to explain this to us because we don't have a clue what you're talking about. Then he asked him, now you understand? Oh, yeah, we got it. Mm-hmm. We got it, sure. Yeah. Got it locked down right here now. He's also said that a lot of people don't believe, understand these parables because they are unbelieving, right? They don't have faith. If they had faith, they would believe the parables. They would understand the parables. So he's kind of linked not being able to understand the parables with unbelief. So nobody wants to confess up that they, uh, they don't understand the parables now. But nevertheless, <laughs> to some extent, I guess they understood them. So they answered, yeah. We got it. Makes perfect sense now. And so here's what he says, verse 52. Therefore, he said to them, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out out of his storehouse treasures new and old. And so the tricky part about this parable is the the word teachers of the law who become disciples. That that word in in the Greek is a scribe. Every scribe who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a, a person who owns a house or, or a keeper of a house, a head of a house. And so is he talking about the office of scribe that they had in that day and age? See, in the New Testament time when Jesus was speaking, scribes, you hear that scribe and Pharisees are often used. Scribes are people literally that just copied the Bible. They would make copies by hand. Well, you can understand that making copies of something, if you, if you copied your Bible page for page, word for word, you'd probably get to know it pretty good, wouldn't you? That's a good way to learn it. Well, that's what happened. They, it became, they, they were just a function. They just had a job, copy it. But they knew the Bible so well, they began to teach it and interpret it for people. So they became a kind of an upper echelon group. And many of them were part of the Sanhedrin. And they ranked up there with the Pharisees and Sadducees and all that. So is he talking about that? I, I don't think so. I think what's happening here is that, that what Jesus is doing is he's making the disciples and anybody who becomes a disciple of Jesus kind of a equivalent to a New Testament scribe. Here's what I mean. Um, everybody who's a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, by the way, which means a, a learner, follower of Jesus, should be learning the, the Word of God, living the Word of God, and communicating the Word of God to other people. That's what scribes did. That was their function. And he says people who do that, who, who become disciples who are trained, who follow Jesus to understand what he's talking about and begin to follow him, they're like a person who has a, has a head of a house. And the, and the person who's the head of a house is responsible for taking care of the people in the house. What do that mean? He says, bringing something out, new things, old things, all of that. And you think about that. You know, a person who's the head of a house, um, like myself, you know, I keep pieces of rope this long. Anybody else? I keep a piece of a piece, two by four that big. How come? I might need it one day. And when I've kept something like that, a little thing, five, six years, and finally use it, that's a great day for me, right? <laughs> Any other men like me? Borderline, borderline hoarders like me? Okay, good. Well, that's what you do, right? You, you hold on to things because you might need them. You, 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 you keep that. But then you also have to get new stuff, right? So these disciples, these followers of Jesus, you know, they knew a lot about the Old Testament and they were hanging on to it because you've got to bring stuff out of the New Testament and the Old Testament, both. But he's teaching them all of, the, all of these things, all these new things. And he's uh, using new things to educate about old things, right? He's saying this meant this in the Old Testament. Remember when they said this? Here's what it means. So old things and new things. Here's what I think the point is. There's a responsibility of disciples of Jesus Christ to know the word of God, to live the word of God, and to apply it to others and to their own life, to teach it. It comes with a responsibility. Just like the head of a household has a responsibility to take care of those in their household or under their influence, I think that's the case for kingdom citizens. We have a responsibility for those under our influence. 
It's not enough just to know the Word of God. It's not enough just to live the Word of God, but we have to communicate it to them. New and old things. Old Testament, New Testament. Followers of Jesus, kingdom citizens, ought to study, study and read their Bible. And I hear a lot of excuses for Christians not knowing their Bible. A lot. And frankly, they're all terrible, all right? I've never heard a good one. Never heard of a good one. We ought to know and love our Bible and use it, communicate it, share it with others. Well, it's kind of a hodgepodge message today, kind of a shotgun, all these different uh, parables as we kind of wrap this up. So let me wrap it up in, in a similar fashion by asking you this question. Are you a kingdom citizen? You've been to church uh, the last few weeks. You've probably heard a lot about the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. Are you a citizen in the kingdom of heaven? Have you by faith been uh, secured as a kingdom citizen for all eternity? You know, we don't become kingdom citizens when we enter into heaven. We become kingdom of heaven citizens here on earth. Matter of fact, if you wait till you stand at the pearly gates to try to become a kingdom citizen, you're going to be sorely, sorely mistaken. The way we become kingdom citizens is because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And by faith, by faith, we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, his perfection for our wickedness, our evil, our sin. And by faith, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, God accepts us as perfect creations, righteous in his sight. He makes us kingdom citizens. Have you become a kingdom citizen? Listen, if you... Um, joined another country, if you became a citizen of another country, you would probably remember the time you did that, right? You wouldn't say, well, I actually became a citizen of that country, but I just don't remember when. You'd probably remember that, wouldn't you? I'm telling you today, if you've become a, a, a kingdom citizen, you'll probably remember when you did it. You'll probably remember a moment when you did it. Remember, you have to become a citizen. It's not just like you were born. You were born an American. Well, you're not born a Christian. No, you're born again a Christian. You become a Christian. You become a kingdom citizen. Can you remember the moment when you changed your citizenship to the kingdom of heaven? If not, today you could do that. You could do that today. Today you could become a kingdom citizen. You could secure eternity in heaven, but also a life walking with Jesus, a changed life here on earth today. I want to invite you into that. Uh, it's made a big impact. It's just a little thing. It's just a little thing, right? It's just a little prayer. You pray. There's a little bit of faith. But if you'll be obedient to do that, God can do big things. It can be pervasive. It can be widespread in its influence throughout your life. Would you do that today? Would you bow your head for just a moment and close your eyes? And, and I just do that so you can focus. I just do that so you can have a moment to think about these things and pray about these things. So I ask you one more time, has there been a moment, a time in your life when you by faith prayed, asked Jesus to come into your heart and forgive your sins, you gave your life to him? You surrendered. And you know, I, notice I didn't ask if you uh, had gone to church your whole life or if you'd been baptized or um, joined the church or been to Sunday school. I didn't ask any of those. I asked, I asked is there a moment in your life where you, between you and God, prayed and asked Jesus into your heart and meant it and were serious about it. And he responded from heaven and came into your heart and saved you from your sins. Has there been a time where that happened? I want you to pray about that this morning. And if you find that there's not been that time, you think of yourself as a Christian, you think of yourself as a good person, but there's never been a time where you became a Christian. Then would you pray right where you're at between you and God, just a little thing, and ask Jesus to come into your heart and forgive your sins once and for all. Give your life to him. I'll give you a moment to pray this morning.
If you're here today and you've uh, prayed this morning and asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, we want to celebrate that with you. We're so excited that you've done that. It's a huge deal. It's a big deal in your life, and we want to celebrate that. And in just a moment, I want to invite you as we, we're going to stand. And as we do, would you come forward and talk to me or one of the guys down here with me this morning so we can talk you through that and celebrate that with you and help you with the next steps in, in becoming a sing, kingdom citizen and, and following Jesus for the rest of your life. Or maybe you're here and you've, you've been saved, you've asked Jesus into your heart, but there's not been a time where you followed through in believer's baptism, and we'd love to talk to you about that, M- making sure you have that area of obedience covered in your life, and we want to chat with you about that and, and get that scheduled for you and, and tell you what that in, in, uh, entails. Maybe you're here, and this is where God has uh, called you to be a member. He's called you to put down roots at First Baptist Church and become a, a member here and, and, and be plugged in and be involved and be known and know others. It's so important for your spiritual growth to be plugged in. This is where I'm going to be, and I'm going to be here, and I'm going to grow here. If that's you, I want to encourage you in just a moment when we stand. Would you come and talk to us? We'd love to chat with you about that this morning and uh, kind of tell you what that entails. All right? So as we stand, as we stand, you go ahead and come. If you need to come, just make your way to the front. And I search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's no this morning for this morning's offering. We pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for loving us like you do. We thank you for providing to us. We thank you for what you've done in our church, in your church, Father, and what you're doing in this place today. And as you just continue to stir our, our hearts, that we'd be soft towards you, we'd be obedient towards you, and as we give back to you today, just uh, to realize that your mission is being accomplished here. And we're so thankful we get to do that together and calling us to do that together. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Of endless world, no one. Can 
could express how much you deserve. And though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. And I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself. It's not what you have required, no. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart, and I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Hey, I want to thank you for coming to church today. We're so glad you're here. Be careful out there. I don't know what the weather's going to do, but y'all be careful out there. Hey, I want to tell you, this is our last uh, day that we collect our Great Commission missions offering for the year. Uh, so far, our goal was $13,000 for the year, and we collected 16550 so far. So pray, that doesn't count today. So that's awesome. But I want to tell you, you can actually give to that any time throughout the year, whenever you want to give to that. If, if we, we do it in December and January. Um, but the truth is, you know, in Baptist life, there's, there's uh, offerings that they want you to collect for local missions, statewide missions, national missions, all that stuff uh, throughout the year. We do it all at once in December and January, and we call it that Great Commission's Mission Offering. But if there's a better time for you to give to that, you can give to that any time. Throughout the year, just make sure you put that on your, your check or your, your giving card or whatever, and we'll make sure it goes to that for next year, okay? So if you missed that, that's okay. You can still give to it whenever you want to, and we'll update you next week on a total uh, for that for this year, all right? Let me close this in a word of prayer. Thank you so much for being here. We're glad you're here, and we hope you uh, come back and see us real soon. We're, we're here on Wednesday night for all of our normal activities, and of course, next week as well. God, we love you. Thank you, Father, for bringing us here together to worship you. Thank you that we get to do it. Thank you, God, that we have this place in order to do it and these people to, to worship with and to serve with. What a privilege it is, God. We, we pray today for each one that's gathered here and their families and their homes and their kids and all the things they've got going on in their lives. I pray, God, you'd bless them and that you would increase their faith and our faith today and bring us all back together very soon. We love you and pray in your wonderful name. Amen.